When I look at the business, I, I don't consider myself successful. I consider myself hardworking, but when there is a harvest, it's a, hey, thank you, that came from above. Because if you look at the business plan, you say, oh, you're making money in Seattle building furniture. It just doesn't make sense. Have you ever wondered what it takes to sustain a continuous improvement movement for more than 20 years? If so, you're in luck since that's precisely what my guests and his company have done. His name is Jeff Koss, and he's the president of a Washington-based company called Koss Taylor. Now, during today's show, Jeff walks us through their journey, starting from the beginning before bringing us up to the present day. Now, as you may have noticed, I'm battling some allergies and a bit of a cold, so I do apologize for sounding a bit like a frog, but I did my best. Now, show notes for this episode, which will include links to everything we discuss, can be found over at GembaPodcast.com. Just look for episode 211. Again, that's GembaPodcast.com, and just look for episode 211. You can also check out Gemba Academy's Lean Learning System over at GembaAcademy.com with a fully functional trial. Now, let's get to the show. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. So where are you calling in from, Jeff? I'm calling from my shop in Muckleteo, Washington. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, and it's pretty early out there right now, so thanks for, for coming on so early. Have you had some coffee? <laughs> yeah, I'm drinking coffee, so if you hear that on the on the audio, you might have to edit that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, <laughs> and I've already warned you, I'll warn the listeners, that I'm, I'm battling Texas allergies and a cold mixed together, so I sound a little froggy, so I apologize. <laughs> but but yeah. we'll, we'll work through it. Yeah, uh, well, I don't have any excuses for how I sound. You sound so. really good. You got a very silk radio <laughs> voice, man. You sound great. There you go. There you <laughs> go. Right. Hey, so uh, before we get into into your business, let's talk about Jeff. Uh, talk a little bit about your your background and uh, you know how you got into what you do today. Uh, so I'm, I'm 50 years old. Uh, so get the idea that I'm about half dead or maybe a little over, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, the business that I operate was was given to me by my father, so I'm second generation, and uh, actually was given to my marriage, uh, mainly so that I protected my marriage and my business. And uh, so uh, I've had responsibility for uh, the business for about 20 years. I'm a father of four, grandfather of one and a half. Nice. And uh, uh, yeah, my my kind of my. My, my life story is really uh, try to be a guy that honors, uh, honors God first, then, yeah. then wife, then kids, and then way in fourth place is business. Yeah. And uh, so, the, but the business is still what, what an oppor- opportunity to, to grow and learn and serve yeah. uh, other people. So, Beautiful. Um, and then the background on, on Kaizen or Lean, uh, I don't actually use the word Lean, I use Kaizen. Uh, was really just uh, I was I'm not the smartest guy in in the in the in the group so I'm not I'm not the most motivated guy so I'm not the ambitious uh, leader who goes out and sets the world on fire uh, I, I uh, I'm a guy who looks at the business and says how do we make this uh, do what it's supposed to do uh, serve other people uh, have sustainability and when I got the business at 30 years old, I was like, oh, crap. Not only am I not so smart, um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we had a customer at the time uh, that makes airplanes out here in the Seattle area. Uh, kind of uh, strongly uh, uh, recommend um, that, that we would be learning about lean. And at that, that's when I first met John Miller, uh, so yeah. one of the, your, your colleagues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and he and his partner came out and started teaching us about the seven ways. And uh, at some point, I, I looked at my dad had just retired, I think, and I called him up and I'm like, I think this might be true. Like, I think this these seven ways, I think those are really like I, I, at that time, I wouldn't have called it sin, but I'd say those are for sure wrong. And uh, I don't know how to get rid of it, um, but it all sounds too good to be true. So would you be one to go with me to Japan? and go see it for ourselves. And I begged John and Brad at the time and said, please take me. I just, it just sounds too good to be true. And, uh, yeah, our journey started that day. We, really, when we got to Japan, my dad, like day two, he's like, yeah, dummy, this is what I've been trying to teach you. Yeah. And, and then his next question is, what did you learn in college? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, actually, I learned everything the opposite. Yeah. So I have to unlearn a lot. Yeah. So, does that give you a good background? No, that's really good. That's really good. So when when was that? Like, was that in the uh, in the nineties or? Yeah, it'd be about twenty years ago. So okay. yeah, yeah, and it was really you know I saw it 
um, of course, my first, you know, impression was that we're different, so it doesn't fully apply. Yeah. And it wasn't until I went my third trip with those guys, I'm, I came back. I'm like, oh crap! It for sure, it for sure applies. We just have to do it differently. Right. And it was it really at that moment we we because we're a high mix, low volume operation in the factory. Um, I realized at that moment, just pure, you know, luck, whatever you want to call that. Uh, everybody in my, my company needs to understand the seven ways. It has to be a culture, can't be a tool. Mm -hmm. And that really, uh, put us, put in motion activities that, uh, cause what we have today. Okay. Let's talk about your business cost tailored. Like what do you guys do? And, uh, um, and then, yeah, just start there. What do you guys do? Yes, we, uh, we, we, we say we're a furniture company, so we build you know, sofas and love seats for organizations that are selling coffee or shoes like Nordstrom. Um, and so we have commercial contract. We also have a line of furniture that uh, we uh, make called Design on Stock uh, USA. It's a Dutch designer line for consumers. So that's uh, also sofas, love seats, chairs for home. And then uh, really the bulk of our business right now is aviation. So uh, when there's a, a presidential airplane um, that needs to be reupholstered, we do VIP aircraft. Um, we do flight attendant seats. Quite a bit of production directly for the the big players. Wow! And yeah, we got about 200 people that uh, work together to do, and it's all high mix, low volume. I think our average order quantity is two and a half. Wow. So it's 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 uh, we automate what we can. So we're really good at uh, mass production of order entry and. Uh, pack lists and packaging, but, uh, uh, you know, the shapes of the things vary day to day. Now, it, is it true that it's, it's rare to see a business such as yours in the U S yeah, I think we're one of, you know, it, for sure. Uh, you know, the, 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 the business was hollowed out, uh, moved from North Carolina to China, you know, 15 years ago. And there are a few people coming back. Obviously there's, uh, uh, some some players are moving back. There's a, a I think a bit a bit of a change. Building furniture in the Seattle area is 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 extra stupid. Uh, it's it's if, if you wrote a business plan and went to investors, uh, I don't think you'd even get an appointment. Okay. So yeah yeah, it's it's just not a great not a great idea. High cost uh, uh, high cost of living. Um, if we, if we weren't doing Kaizen, this business would be dead for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now you mentioned earlier that you used the word Kaizen over lean. I'm just curious, what, why is that? Yeah, so lean. Uh, so I, I might end up swearing, so you might have to oh, edit. Okay. But I'm sorry. It's, it's it's really kind of a four letter word to me because um, when you we we have all these tours, so we've probably had forty thousand people visit us over the past ten years, trying to figure out you know what they're doing. And I always ask the question, hey, so you know what what is lean? You know why are people doing it? Why are you here? And and it always comes down to well, the bosses are trying to cut. And, and there's an acronym, less employees are needed at some of the companies. And, and, and to take it a little further, I never once saw a company that was actually improving continuously, like what I expect from a Kaizen type of mindset, and actually use the word lean. Lean is, is actually a destination. And if you understand waste, like we're never going to get there. So, um, and then the next part is I, when I went to Japan, I never once heard a Japanese person say lean. Yeah. They always say Kaizen. If you look at the word Kaizen, it actually means something totally different, which I know you know about. Yeah. And and when you look at the root of that and you look at the behaviors needed from leadership all the way to cleanup boy, which is where I started, it's it's sacrifice plus discipline. It's the idea that yeah. we're always room to improve. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. It's like um, it's calling an airplane a car. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I got it. I got it. So, all right. Well, I want to jump back 20 years to the beginning of your journey. And I think, is, is it safe to say the why of your beginning was the, the supplier coming to you? Was that why you started? Customer. Yeah. 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 Boeing. Or sorry. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, all right. So that's the why. Like, what did you do? I mean, you, I know you, you brought John and those guys in, but were you just, were you really just focused on the, uh, on the seven ways? Is that kind of where you began or talk about those early days? So I can say the early days was, uh, absolutely. I was confused by everything I saw and read and, and, uh, yeah. So the earliest you know motivation was just fear. Because the offer coming from from the Boeing company at the time was, hey, that we'll we'll teach you lean, we'll bring out our consultants, and uh, we'll teach you how to uh, do this lean thing, and uh, if you save a dollar, we'll we'll keep half, and you can keep half. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, usually when a big company comes to a small company to help, that isn't, that isn't such good news, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So it was really fear and a little bit of like, man, if they come in and find a bunch of money laying around, shame on me. Uh, so we hired John and Brad and said, Hey, will you just come teach us this crap? Like just come out. And, uh, first thing they wanted to do was do like a four day workshop. And we're like, Hey, uh, sorry. Um, Nordstrom's a really good customer. We're not shutting our factory down to learn something for a different customer. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to come in and teach us these seven ways at lunch? And I think we had seven lunches and they taught us the seven ways. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in the early days they did the right thing by saying, Hey, the core issue is really this waste stuff. Um, and they would tell me later that uh, on the first tour, they're a little bit intimidated because we didn't have the usual easy uh, consultant uh, things to do. So that it wasn't a dirty shop. Um, we didn't have a lot of inventory, didn't have a rework area. We were doing one piece flow, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, not knowing, but the, the business required it because we were kind of made to order a uh, shop. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was, it was learning that. But and, and then going to Japan, I was I was absolutely overwhelmed, overwhelmed by Okay, there's Kanban, there's Visual Management, Pokey Oak. Oh my gosh, like what what does this all mean? I didn't understand it was a system, didn't understand that the at the very core of it, that you were talking about this is the bad stuff, get rid of the bad stuff. Yeah. Um, and it was is really just my ignorance that kept it from moving forward. I could not get it. Mm -hmm. Could not um, and uh, literally I went to Japan with my dad and another guy and uh, we brought back some tools. You know, so if you think about our shop being a garden, um, let's say we're growing corn. I brought back a chainsaw and I was so excited about the chainsaw. I brought some back for my colleagues. So they're using the chainsaw everywhere they went. And it turns out we not only got rid of some weeds, but we got rid of some corn. Mm. So it was, it was chaotic. But when we actually did eliminate waste, all of us would sit back and go, okay, life's better. Um, and then like a few months later, we back doing our own bad habits. So we basically had this, if you were watching us from the moon, you'd be like, Oh, Hey, look, the animals are going to water and they're drinking water. Yeah. Now they're running back to the desert. And they're, they're, <laughs> what's wrong with those animals? Yeah. Why don't they go back to the water? Yeah. That, that's what we were doing for the early years. Yeah. So, okay. Talk about, was there a tipping point to where you kind of finally got it? And if so, what, what did that look like? What did that feel like? What, what was going yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. Several times. So if you think of it as like an onion, I hate that analogy, but it, it's been several times in my career that I'm like, oh, crap, I thought I knew. And then I've, uh, the, the, the layer comes off and the lights come on. You're like, oh, it's a totally different show. Um, the, the, the first one really was with my dad. You know, in, in Japan, the yeah, dummy thing, uh, it probably had a few F words around it. Um, <laughs> it was a real serious like this is. Yeah. So I could see the anguish like. Uh, and it was, he was frustrated with himself that he didn't have a way of teaching it, but it, uh, I got all 40 years of his, uh, um, understanding of the world mm -hmm. in that moment. It was Jeff go. Yeah, this is the right way. Um, so that was probably big number one. Um, the next one was after our third trip, I went with a current general manager and a current operations manager guys you actually know, I think. And, uh, we sat around, uh, uh we got back and like, can we agree that whenever we're different than Toyota, that we're freaking wrong? And instead of discussing why it won't work, let's just freaking copy them and discuss what we learned instead. Let's take all the energy, move it on the learning side rather than the shall we do it side. Um, so I would say that was the next layer where we, could, we, we really felt deeply convicted, like we are wrong. They are right. Not only are we wrong, but we're hurting people. Started to understand that it's, it's not really a, a business issue. It's, it it start, started at that point to become a moral issue for me. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the third trip for sure, I can, I can picture their faces and yeah, I, I swear too often. And I was really pissed. Like what is wrong with us? Um, yeah. And then we have to fast forward probably about to, uh, eight years ago. We, we, you know, we've always done these tours. We've had people touring us for, for actually the whole time because we, we, we had applied this as, as a very um, black and white because we were told these are principles. So and I, I'm, when, I, when I say principles, I mean these are like laws of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm like, well, if it's a law of the universe, then it's always trustworthy. So let's just copy it and we'll find the hole in the system and then we can tell everybody we found the hole. Mm -hmm. So 
five or 10 years into tr- teaching people about this, we're like, hey, um, we haven't found any holes. Seven wastes are always the seven wastes. doesn't matter what industry you're in. It always adds anxiety and causes quality and lead time. And crap, it's true. So uh, we, we had a group of doctors come over from uh, Holland on a trip to kind of tour local places. I think Virginia Mason, maybe Seattle Children's, and somehow we got on the dance card. And uh, they, 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 they walked away and, and called me a little later and said, you know, we paid a lot of money to go to some of these other organizations. And all 25 of us agreed that we learned the most at your place. Uh, would you be willing to come to Holland and, and uh, teach? And I'm like, well, yeah, on one condition, I'll pay my way. So uh, I won't accept money right now because I don't know if I'm, you know, competent. Um, but uh, so I got to go to Holland with a colleague. Um, in our in our presentation, we, we try to make things really simple, and uh, we had a, a he, we, yeah, we made a drawing of a, a dog taking a dump in the house, and uh, basically the, the idea is in most organizations, um, and, and and I'm sure many of the listeners can relate to this is you can see the waste, but your structure prevents you from getting rid of it. Mm-hmm. So you're 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 in this place where you're like I can see overproduction, I can see motion, but technically I can't remove it because of some organizational structure issue. So, you know, our, our teaching at the moment was, Hey, look, when you see a pile of crap, you know, do you ask for permission? Do you have a meeting about it? Do you polish it? Or do you just get it out of the house? Like basic Kaizen is just knowing that that's bad and getting rid of it. So at the end of this, and it was kind of crude conversation, but it was, it was a really cute dog taking a dump. Uh, so a woman at the end of this presentation and, she, and I, I and literally like I, w- I want to find this woman. I, every time I go back to Holland, I'm like, okay, uh, one of my friends there. Have you found the woman who asked this question? I need to punch her and hug her. I'll probably hug her first. Yeah. She, she I'm standing in front of everybody. She said, Jeff, Mr. And, and I'm, my last name means cheese in Dutch, which is really fun. Man, Mr. Cheese, who is the dog? I'm like, oh crap. My, I mean, literally, my knees got weak. I'm like, I'm the dog. <laughs> that that. That ruined me, like ruined, ruined me. Like literally at that moment, I felt like, yeah, it was emotional. It was uh, like, like the, a ton of bricks was just, it hit me in the head. Like I am the one causing all the waste in my factory and it's hurting my family, my colleagues, my customers. Huh. I got to change. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty big. And from that, <laughs> yeah, it sucked. I'll just tell you that. Like it was... It was a, a solid year of, yeah, yeah, heavy so, stuff. I know it sounds weird, but it just at that moment, I'm like, it's a moral problem. It's it's it was a collision of my my business, my faith, uh, my maturity as a dude, kind of. Yeah. And uh, that's when we really stepped on the gas. I will not be the guy who's going to run a company that will hurt people, and these people that are touring our factory. If you're in my factory and you're here to learn. Uh, there will be no no punches hold held. Mm-hmm. So especially if if you have authority, um, if you come and ask a question, you're going to get it. Mm-hmm. How many different languages are spoken in your company? I think eleven. Oh, yeah. Wow. So like, yeah. how, how does that work as far as like kaizen and uh, teaching and and so forth? How do you do that? Yeah. So it's a blessing. So some, some people call it a challenge. I'll call it a blessing. Um, the coolest part of this is, is it's not the language. It's, it's, uh, you look at how my colleagues got to America and all of them have stories that should be, they they could be movies. Like each one of them, their escape from Vietnam or uh, behind, you know, what they live like, uh, behind the iron curtain. Um, it just, uh, it's not the language that, that is, is such a deal. So the blessing is I've got, uh, colleagues who have incredible stories and, uh, uh, it, it drives us to say, well, what if we had to go to another country and provide for our families? So it's really uh, a blessing because it causes us to say, well, we want them to feel loved. We want them to be able to move forward. Mm-hmm. And um, body language is 80% of communication anyhow. Yeah. So what are we worried about the words for? Right. Now, yes. when you want to use words, yeah, you're, you're screwed. So when you, when you, you, I think you've been in our factory a few years ago, yeah. it's even more visual today than it was before. You know, eyes, eyes, people, and, and math is, you know, pretty straightforward. So most people, you know, regardless of where you, you've been, you understand math. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you've been to an airport or a train station or you drive a car, 
you, there's a lot of systems we can harness. So it's, it's a massive blessing. But if you're trying to uh, explain something theoretical, um, you have to be able to do that visually. Um, and my, my colleagues pay attention to actions more than words anyhow. And that's true everywhere, by the way. Mm-hmm. So um, if I'm a hypocrite, which I am most of the time, they all know. Yeah. Because they're watching. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about your tours now. So obviously you've been doing them for a long time. Um, understand yeah. you've recently started to charge for them, right? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so, it's so, a change. So so what, what, what was the, what, why that change? Yeah, so the tours, we really, it was, it was, yeah, it's a great question. The tours we've done, we were doing uh, three tours a week. Uh, there was usually 40, 50 people per tour. And we did that for 40 weeks a year wow. and I attended and taught every one of them. Mm. And so for 10, 12, 13 years, and what we found was there were some organizations that were taking our gift cause it was literally four hours of free, decent training, maybe not the best, but it was high energy and high effort anyways. Mm-hmm. And a lot of organizations were sending the middle people and all we were doing was letting them know that they're victims. Leaders weren't doing anything about it. Yeah. Now, there were some companies who were running like crazy and doing great stuff and they kept coming back. And uh, so <clears throat> we have this ambition, if, if, if our company, if our, our most valuable uh, thing to this world is um, you know, growing people, growing our own and growing colleagues, there, there should be a financial model behind that. Yeah. And, and I was really torn between ministry and work. Like, okay, well, I'm trying to love my neighbors, and a woman came in and she said, you know, I sat down with her and she was explaining her business model and she's like, well, how much do you charge for tours? I'm like, oh, we don't charge. And she goes, well, that's stupid. You're doing pro bono work for fortune 500 companies. Hmm. And as soon as she said pro bono, I thought, wow, <laughs> I feel super stupid. And then we were talking a little bit more and, and, and she's like, Jeff, does your pastor, you know, at your church, does he, does he get paid to do his job? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, yeah. She said, do you read the Bible? Like it says, you know, don't, don't harness the ox while he's working. Like, okay, I'm so glad you're not my wife. Because your <laughs> poor husband, he's screwed. Uh, so it was really that moment where we're like, okay, um, if we're truly valuable, we're going to actually go big on this. Um, we want to grow people. Selling furniture is not going to finance the ambition that we have. And frankly, when people pay for something, they value it. Sure. And we've already seen that. We've already seen that. Yeah. 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 So what is truth bit pull? Yeah. So when we we started to charge for it, we were like, okay, we got to set up a a company and, um, it doesn't make sense to call it that because it's super confusing. But as we've gone through the teaching, what we, we really have uh, made a connection in the seven ways. So we can say, Hey, defects are kind of outcomes like profit or harvest. You know, you can influence that stuff, but uh, it's really, you know, it's an outcome. The, the, the other ways are, are usually the root causes of defects and, and the most evil of all of them is overproduction mm-hmm. and, and overproduction in a factory is, is it's bad. Um, but the blessing of overproduction in a factory is you can see it. You can see piles of inventory. Um, you can see people pushing, you can see all the stress. It's a little harder to see in a hospital or in the way that we lead or the way that, uh, even I, I do Kaizen with, friends and family or my soccer team. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we started looking, okay, what is the evidence for overproduction when we're not really just in a factory? And, and so we, we said, okay, whenever we see batches, batch, batch work for sure, that's overproduction. Um, and, and what is the opposite of batch? And, and, and we came up with the word bit because, you know, it, uh, if I say one piece flow, and actually this is kind of what, what John and, and Brad taught us early, one piece flow, freaked me out. So I didn't do anything for three years because I could not imagine mm-hmm. doing one at a time. Mm-hmm. Just, I, I thought they were crazy. I thought that was the one part of the doctrine that they were wrong on. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just said, Hey, if you're doing batch work, start moving into bits and you'll be on the right track. So think of it as a, as a, a train track point towards bits and just start cutting your batch size until you get to one, but don't, don't get overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Second thing that we're looking for in a factory or especially in healthcare, we're looking for push. So if I see anything that moves along through the work being pushed on somebody, I think, okay, uh, we, we've got ourselves overproduction. And, uh, and that could even be uh, the way we run our business. So if I go out and say, hey, you know, we're doing this lean thing. Um, here's some medicine. Take it. It'll fix you. That's, that's a little bit push. Um, the opposite of that is pull. So, hey, change the 
framework of your conversation from push to pull. An example of that would be if, if I, I go home and I try to fix my wife by changing her kitchen mm-hmm. for her. Uh, so, and I actually did this as a family. I went and, you know, changed my wife's kitchen because I saw, okay, I see you're really wasteful. I see anxiety and I see anxiety is going to kill you. So, hey, I'm going to fix you. Um, and it turns out that pushing that on her uh, really caused a lot of trouble in my family. The method of my service to her was push. Yeah. If I were to pull, it would have been a little bit different. I would have said, hey, Stacy, I, I want to be a better husband. I'm going to go get some counseling. And, uh, you know, would you be willing to help me if uh, the counselor guy gives me some assignments? Uh, so pull is the opposite of push. And if you look at uh, uh, any kind of, uh, oh, we see a ton of this in healthcare. Most of the work that's set up is set up around silos. So it's almost all the work moves to a hospital batch push. Mm-hmm. Um, So if you add to that, uh, so if you look at a lot of motion, for example, motion waste, Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get to truth. If you look at most of what my management job was before we had a visual management system, my job was sifting through emails, reports, meetings, conversations to find the truth. I was always searching for truth and and then trying to do something with it. Mm -hmm. So the antidote to overproduction is if I have a system based on sound principles and I have access to truth. If I work to the customer's pull and I work in little bits, it's really hard to have much waste. Mm. So the antidote to the seven wastes in our worldview is moving in the direction of truth, bit and pull. Wow. That's awesome. (laughs) It's it's been fun and we've been testing it and we we're pretty, we're excited about it because we haven't read it in a book. We don't really read books and, uh, and uh, we see that it's working. Yeah. So last question for this section, and we'll jump into that, what we call the reflection section, which is some quick fire questions. But if, if people want to come and, uh, you know, uh, experience uh, your your truth bit poll or cost Taylor or attend one of your day camps, what do they do? Where do they go? Yeah, they go to a website. So truthbitpull.com or costtailored.com and select tours. And both of them will get you to uh, a place of uh, where you can enter in your information. Otherwise, you can Google me, Jeff Koss, K-A-A-S, yeah. and I'm easy to find. Yeah. Um, and you can call me and we can talk about it. I, I would say that uh, it's normal for uh, somebody in an organization to say, uh, we've done programs, we've done projects, we want a culture. Mm-hmm. And that's really who comes and visit us now is, is how do we lead this in such a way that we can leave a lasting impact in this culture and bake continuous improvement into the cake? Yeah. And, and that's really where uh, our, our, I would still call it ministry because it's, yeah, you're, 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 you're paying for a tour, but you get, uh, you get a connection to us. And at that point you have access to our tools. We FaceTime people all the time and we have organizations that we have deep lasting relationships that, uh, and the waste tours, the, the waste tours are kind of introductory deals. So that's a, a four hour deal. The day camps, which are our most impactful uh, we spend a whole day teaching and experiencing, and then we also have a boot camp for leaders who just want to. Uh, the, the one thing that when we went to Japan uh, and, and previous trips with with John is, hey, park us in a in a in a a place for a week, and let's just see all the crap. Let's see like what it really feels like. So the boot camp experience is just come hang out, and uh, we'll show you all the dirt because we are absolutely really still wasteful and struggling, and yeah. So you get. Uh, that's really only for leaders, people with authority who like they really want to get a full sense of systemically how does this all work and how is it all connected and you know yeah yeah awesome very good very good all right so let's jump into this uh, reflection sec- uh, section Jeff I got a, a, just a few questions I want to ask you the first one is is there a an area of of kaizen that you struggle with or maybe you wonder if it really works. <laughs> So <clears throat> when I say Kaizen, I mean uh, the seven ways are bad. Everybody in the organization should have the right to learn what they are. Do I think there's a lot? Do I think that it hurts me? Shall I give a sh- do something about it? So Kaizen to me means, do you know the seven ways? Do you believe that they are hurting you and your family and your community and your shareholders? And do you care enough to help remove those ways? Mm-hmm. That version of Kaizen, there's, I've never, ever, 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 ever found 
anything that is wrong with that. It's pull the weeds from your garden. Do it in community. Um, do the weeds when they're small. Don't wait till they're big. Um, and uh, watch your watch your crop grow. Okay, well, uh, if you, let me yeah, rephrase. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Let me rephrase yeah. it then. I know you don't call it lean or, or even so-called practice lean, but just maybe on a broader sense of continuous improvement, let's call it that. Is there, yeah, yeah. Is there an area of continuous improvement that you struggle with or, or, or wonder, you know, does this really work? I think when you violate the principles, I think for sure it doesn't work. So, for example, if you look at um, a lot of Kaizen, when, when I say the word Kaizen, most big company people think, oh, that's a five-day Kaizen event. Mm-hmm. So by definition, a five-day event is overproduction. So we don't do five-day events in our company because we, it's, it's, uh, it's leading with the worst waste of all. So if you think of a, a five-day event, I, I look at that and say, ooh, that's somebody who doesn't understand that overproduction causes all the other waste. Hmm. Uh, it's a batch. It's very frequently pushed. And if it's a, a big Kaizen, there's a lot of um, opportunity or uh, motivation to focus on those results at, at the consequence of other things. Mm-hmm. So we, we, when we look at some of the tools, that is one tool that would say, hey, if, if a consultant says let's do a five-day rapid improvement workshop, it's probably more about her travel schedule than it is about actually continuous improvement. Yeah. It's, it's batch work. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, That's yeah, one yeah. example. Is yeah. that what you're looking no, for? I got it. Yeah, it makes sense. Total sense. All right. What's the best advice you've ever received, Jeff, over, over, your, over your years? Yeah. You know, the best advice I ever got was actually from my dad. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. My dad, um, he started the business. He ran the business. But because of the way that he ran the business, the consequence, and it had a lot of waste in it because he didn't understand this, um, which meant he wasn't home much which meant uh, his marriage kind of didn't work so much, which meant his relationship with his kids wasn't so great. So when he gave me the business, he said, if you have to work more than about 10 hours a day, you're a failure. Do not let this business ruin your life. And I look at the, how that relates to Kaizen is if you walk into most organizations and you actually quantify the seven ways, most of us are still spending more than 50% of our time on one of the seven ways. And what that means is, Every minute of waste is stolen from uh, our shareholders, our colleagues, or our families. And this is where it becomes a moral question. So my dad's worldview and Kaizen, and then you know, what I, when I'm 80 years old and I look back on my life, if I get to live that long, I look back and say, well, what do I want to fail at? I, you know, I don't want to fail at being a husband or a father or a business person, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, the best advice was don't let this thing be your God, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Last question. What are you most proud of as it relates to your, your journey with, with all things improvement? Yeah, pride is a hard one for me. I'm, I'm thankful. I can say I'm thankful for the people uh, in, in my organization that have allowed me to lead. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the, the, the moment a leader understands that voluntarily people show up and allow you as a leader move the ball in a, in a worldview, mm-hmm. it's a massive gift, whether that's your kids allowing you to a lead, your, your, your spouse, uh, your colleagues, uh, it's a gift. So I'm not proud of that. It's, it's yeah. just, uh, it's, uh, yeah. Thankful for. Yeah. No, I, Hey, no, I, I, we actually, the last episode, Steve Kane, one of my colleagues and I got on and we talked about, uh, pr- uh pride, vanity, and what we call sensuality, kind of like just being, you know, chilling and enjoying the, you know, beer is good so more beer is better right you know so, um so so yeah like i'm, I'm just kind of going off path you just mentioned pride like how do you you're a man of faith obviously so like yeah. how do you you've been very successful right so how do you ba- battle battle the the temptation if you will to to be proud and uh and maybe even vanity a little bit you know kind of like thinking what, what what people think of you and stuff like how do you battle that yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. I I I think um, yeah. So when you're a business owner, you know this. Um, there's always something horrible happening, and <laughs> always something good happening. Yeah. And if if we allow uh, the good in, we need to let the bad in. Yeah. And and so when, when we really 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 get to it, spending time on the farm with my my grandma actually. <laughs> um, she would actually teach me. You know, Jeff, we we can't make the corn grow. Uh, the, those raspberries there, I, I didn't make the raspberry. 
all we can do is we can water it. Um, we can uh, pull the weeds, but you don't actually make it grow. Mm -hmm. So when there's a harvest or when there's not, either way, you didn't make that happen. You influence it. Yeah. When I look at the business, I don't, I, I don't consider myself successful. I consider myself hardworking, but when, when there is a harvest, it's a, hey, thank you, that came from above. Because if you look at the, the, the business plan, you say, oh, you're making money in Seattle building furniture. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I, I'm still, most people say he's an arrogant ass, 100% true. I, I am. I'm just, uh, to do a job that, that you have um, where you have to guess what the future is, convince people in some way to move in that direction or put resources to move, there's a whole lot of arrogance that goes with that. However, the way that I make those decisions are, are based on what are the laws of the universe? Mm -hmm. um, and based on those laws, where shall we go? And there's a heck of a lot of prayer involved with every harvest. So, mm -hmm. so, so when you look at like how I run the business, um, you, you, even when we've had our best years or our worst years, I walk out of here saying, okay, Lord, what do you want to teach me from this? It's, 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 it, I'm not making it happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, I, I don't, I, so it's, it's, I am high ego, I would just say, but, um, but when it comes to about the business or about, uh, yeah, any of these things here, I'm not successful. Like most business people, they'd walk in and say, this guy's an idiot. Like he's just lucky. Mm -hmm. it, it's a simple business. It's yeah. It, yeah. I wouldn't say anybody could do it. Um, I would say anybody who has a passion to serve other people who will trust the laws of the universe and, and move in direction of those laws, um, probably could lead this company. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you're doing a fantastic job, Jeff, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to know you and, and uh, work also, with you guys and, you know, keep up the great work. Um, again, give, give out the websites again for, for Truth Bit Poll and, and Cost Taylor for folks to, to go check you guys out. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the the consulting or the tour business is truthbitpull.com. Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with Truth Pitbull, which is a dog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. A little bit uh, bad marketing there. Yeah. And then uh, the company name is Cos Tailored. So it's K A A S T A I L O R E D.com. But if you're super desperate, just uh, Google Jeff Koss, K A A S, and you'll find me and uh, call me. I'd be happy to talk. Awesome. Awesome. All yeah. right. Well, keep up the good work, my man. And uh, the next time out in the, in the Seattle area, we'll, we'll have to meet up. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Ron. This has been great fun. All right. Take care, Jeff. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Gemba Academy podcast. Now, we invite you to take a no strings attached, fully functional test drive of GembaAcademy.com. Gain immediate access to more than a thousand lean and Six Sigma learning resources, all free of charge at GembaAcademy.com.